Russia invaded Ukraine, partly because Vladimir Putin believed that the country was divided. He expected his troops to be greeted as liberators in many of its oblasts, especially those in the east. None of his fondest hopes came to pass. Instead, the invasion has created a renewed sense of Ukrainian identity, as all segments of society signed on to resist the attack, including the women of Ukraine. In this video, we'll look at those women and the many roles they've played in the war, winning new respect and recognition for themselves in the process against enormously difficult obstacles. In December 2023, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said that the military had proposed mobilizing 450 to 500,000 additional troops for the war effort. The move did not come as a surprise, since Ukraine needs more soldiers after its 2023 counteroffensive in Zaporizhia failed to achieve its objectives. In January 2024, Ukrainian lawmakers clarified that the new law would not draft women. This clarification is in line with the tradition of most countries where women are not subject to mass conscription. However, earlier legislation from 2021, as the threat of an invasion loomed, signaled that women were going to be part of Ukraine's war effort from the beginning and that they would be serving in the areas far exceeding the roles they had traditionally played in the country's military. That year, legislation was passed that required women between 18 and 60 to register for the draft if they were fit for military service and worked in certain professions. This law expanded on an even earlier one and added more professions to the existing list. Previously, women in highly specialized fields, such as medicine, were subject to a draft, but the 2021 law added veterinarians, psychologists, journalists, and even librarians and musicians to the list of professions who could be mobilized in wartime. A further law passed in September 2023 mandated that all women between 18 and 60 with a medical or pharmaceutical background register for military service. However, these women would not be restricted from leaving the country unless they actually were called up to the colors, unlike their male counterparts. Women had served in Ukraine's armed forces since the country's independence in 1991, although it was still rare to see them in roles that went beyond the traditional. Usually they followed their husbands or fathers as they were transferred between military posts. There, the women would take on various menial tasks, such as administrative jobs. This was in line with Soviet tradition. Things started to change after 2014, when Russia annexed Crimea and parts of the Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts proclaimed themselves to be separate, independent republics with Russia's backing. As part of the hostilities in Donbass, which started that year, women served as combat medics, snipers, and even frontline infantry. When women were not called up to actual service, they still contributed to the cause as civilians by obtaining supplies and delivering them to the front lines. The dangers of these logistical roles should not be overstated as logistics are frequent targets for air, artillery, and drone attacks. At the start of the full-scale Russian invasion, women made up about 10% of Ukraine's total military force. About 62,000 women are currently serving in Ukraine's armed forces. Of these, 42,000 are serving in military-related positions, with at least 5,000 deployed to the front lines. The 42,000 women involved in a combat-related role is an increase by 40% compared to 2021, when the new laws on conscription began to pass. About 8,000 women are officers. Today, according to Ukraine's First Lady Olena Zelenska, women make up over 20% of Ukraine's total military force. More than 11,000 women have joined the military on a voluntary basis since the war began. As the war drags on into its third year, more women are voluntarily signing up for camps to teach them combat skills, even if they're unsure about joining the force. Although they are exempt from general conscription, they can sign up for military service voluntarily, and more of them are starting to think about it. In these camps, volunteers from the Ukrainian army teach participants how to operate firearms and grenades. In one camp near Kyiv, visited by reporters from DW News, the targets for the training were mock-ups among the who's who of Russia's leadership. There was the defense minister, Sergei Shoigu. There was his rival, the now-deceased Wagner Group frontman, Yevgeny Prigozhin. There was the Chechen leader, Ramzan Kadyrov. And in hiding, there was Vladimir Putin himself. In addition to weapons training, the women at the camp are taught how to operate in squads. Urban combat training is also typically a part of these exercises. The soldiers operating these camps say that the creation of an all-women course is good for the trainees' morale, as it shows them they're not alone. The women have varied reasons for being there. Some want to join the army out of patriotism or to connect with or discover what happened to their fathers, brothers, boyfriends, and husbands. 
Other women seek the training as an act of self-defense. Some of the women in the camp near Kyiv came from the occupied territories. It's understandable why they, in particular, would seek military training. War crimes, including against civilians, have been frequent in the war in Ukraine. For example, the Russian army has made looting an institution within its ranks. Soldiers have ransacked homes and taken everything from washing machines to lingerie. Unsurprisingly, with such low discipline, crimes against women are also a common occurrence. Sexual violence is widespread in the Russian-occupied territories. In Kherson, which Ukrainian troops liberated in late 2022, prosecutors have collected abundant evidence of crimes against women. These criminal acts include rape, forced nudity, and sexual torture. The oldest victims were over 80. The youngest the prosecutors found was a four-year-old girl who was forced to perform oral sex on a soldier, a crime they classified as rape. Ukrainian prosecutors also found more than a dozen examples of gang rapes, some of which involved family members being forced to watch. The New York Times reported that there were 154 documented cases of conflict-related violence in Kherson, but everyone understood that the real number was far higher. The true extent of sexual violence is difficult to document precisely, especially because victims are often too scared to come forward, a problem exacerbated by Ukraine's low level of infrastructure to support such victims. Women's shelters are rare in Ukraine, for example. Nevertheless, in the villages near Kyiv, which were occupied at the start of the war, investigators found that one in nine women had been subject to some form of sexual assault. As with the widespread practice of looting, Russian officers are often aware of and acquiescent to these incidents, either turning the other way or actively encouraging their men to go ahead. The problem of sexual violence appears to be even worse in the detention centers run by Russian authorities. In Kherson, the use of batons and electric shocks in torture were common. Some Russian soldiers used these as instruments of rape. These methods were similar to those reported in cities under Russian occupation, Human Rights Watch documented similar incidents in the Kharkiv and Chernihiv regions, as the New York Times did in Kherson, and it also reported more incidents of sexual crimes near Kyiv. For the women of Ukraine, learning how to defend themselves is no longer a luxury. Still, Yarina Shornohus, a Ukrainian soldier who spoke to DW about her experiences on the front line, said that women who wished to join the ranks needed to understand that they will be put in a very difficult position, one traditionally assigned to men. Women need to be ready to carry heavy things on the front line, she said. If they're not prepared to do that, it will be best for them to do something else, because otherwise their male comrades would make the assumption that all women are like her, which is in turn not good for women's rights in the army. This is important, as women in the Ukrainian army are not safe from harassment within their own ranks. A 2011 study by the Research Center for Humanitarian Issues of the Armed Forces of Ukraine found that one in 10 women in the Ukrainian military experienced some kind of sexual harassment, sometimes from senior officers. These cases are often difficult to bring to a court of law because of a lack of willingness to come forward and the he-said-she-said nature of the proceedings most of the time. Despite the grave threats from the enemy and the widespread skepticism or harassment from their male comrades, women have served in the Ukrainian army with distinction since the beginning of the war. One role where women have served with particular skill in Ukraine is that of the sniper. After the role of combat medic, women have served as snipers next most often. In this capacity, these women are heirs to a tradition. The Soviet Union famously fielded women in sniper roles during the Second World War, and some of the best of them came from Ukraine. For example, there was Ludmila Pavlichenko, who is credited with 309 kills during the conflict. She was so good that she earned the nickname Lady Death. She was born in a village near Kyiv. In the early days of the war, a woman known by the codename Charcoal became a hero in Ukraine. A former Marine with years of experience in the Donbass War, she was discharged in January 2022, but was back in the ranks when the invasion came. Her call to fighters on the front line to defeat the Orcs gave her notoriety and increased the morale of Ukraine's defenders. She vowed that she would stand to the last against the invaders. Ukrainian soldiers had even begun to compare her to Lady Death herself, although her precise exploits are not known. Olena Bilozerska, another veteran from the Donbass War, also serves as a sniper, and her exploits are better known. She was once almost killed by a tracer bullet which grazed her cheek. By July 2022, she had 10 confirmed kills to her name. In a night engagement that she recorded, she's seen killing three Russian soldiers crawling toward her position 
proving her skill and the effectiveness of the 7.62mm SVDM rifle with the thermal scope that she was using. When the enemy crawls toward our position to kill me, does he think if I have a husband, parents or kids? Of course not, and I don't bother myself with stupid things either. That stuff is for books and movies, she said in an interview days before the invasion began. When the invasion actually did begin, she said that the Battle of Kyiv was like going on safari, because enemy vehicles moving in dense columns were easy prey for ambushes. Survivors of the attacks on the vehicles then fled on foot into the woods, where territorial defense units or even local hunters picked them off. Emerald Evgenia is perhaps the most famous female sniper in Ukraine. Codenamed Ukraine's Joan of Arc, Evgenia was a successful jewelry entrepreneur before the war, and well-known on Ukrainian social media channels. However, she was also an experienced shooter. She got her first gun from her father at the age of nine and hit five targets with five rounds on her first hunt. When the war began, she joined as a sniper, quickly proving skeptics wrong thanks to her ability to shoot down drones. Evgenia married a fellow soldier and fought on the front lines, even up to the point of being 30 weeks pregnant. She is well regarded enough that Russian media has given her a nickname of their own, the Punisher. More systematically, the women among Ukraine's sniper ranks are typically selected from the country's territorial defense units. After distinguishing themselves there, the Ukrainian special forces send them for advanced training in the country's western forests. Recruits to this program will not only get specialized shooting training, but training in tactics, ballistics, and movement. Typically, snipers get over a year of training, and this was once the case in Ukraine, but given wartime demands, the schedule has been shortened to a matter of weeks. One of the instructors in the sniper schools, a man known by his codename Deputy, said that despite his initial skepticism, the women proved themselves to the point that he now believes they are better suited for the sniper role than men. In an interview with The Economist in January 2023, he said that the women were lighter and more nimble, stealthier in retreat, and crucially for a sniper, more patient and less willing to take unjustified risks. He was most impressed with their conduct in a military survival course the Ukrainians call FISO. Of 90 candidates for the course at the time of The Economist's visit, only five passed successfully. Only two of them were men. All three of the women passed. These women had faced stigma from skeptical men, but proved themselves. Because of the nature of their job, snipers have always faced elevated risks from the enemy. If captured, snipers have faced historically harsh treatment, and the women snipers of Ukraine understand that because of their sex, the risks are even higher for them. One such sniper, a woman calling herself Oksana, said, If a woman sniper is captured, she'll be raped, humiliated, tortured, and then executed. A sniper should always be prepared to blow herself up with a grenade. Sharing deputies' belief that women snipers are more patient than their male counterparts is a 32-year-old sniper with Ukraine's 47th Brigade, with the codename Cuckoo. The title was bestowed on her because she tends to perch herself in high places. While there is a tradition of women serving in sniper roles in this part of the world, the women soldiers of this war are also clearing new paths for themselves. Traditional gender roles began to get challenged as early as the Donbass War. In 2016, Ukraine formally allowed women to fight in combat positions. This edict, which came partially in response to women already doing so on an irregular basis, marked a departure from their traditional roles as nurses, cooks, secretaries or seamstresses. Changes began to accelerate after that, and Ukrainian women saw formal service in the volunteer battalions in other roles. The Russian invasion accelerated the changes even more dramatically. Aside from being snipers, Ukrainian women now see service as machine gunners, tank gunners, with grenade launchers and as mortar crews. One area where women have been on a much more equal footing is that of drone operators. As drones have proven themselves to be immensely important in the war, the women piloting them are equally important members of the Ukrainian war effort. Valery Borovic, a drone commander in Ukraine who recruits and trains women operators, said of the task, Women who can fly drones are people who could tomorrow, if needed, get a drone to target artillery fire. The New York Times interviewed several women who were training to become drone pilots, and much like their counterparts in the training camp at Kyiv, each woman had her own reasons for being there. Some were civilians who wanted to have a useful skill if they were ever called up to the colors. Others were already signed up, but were in more traditional support roles and wanted a combat position. Women might not be as physically strong as men, a fact which still limits their ability to join frontline units, but they are on an equal footing as drone pilots, and the women in the Ukrainian military 
are keen to exploit this and win greater recognition and footing for themselves in the process of doing such an important job. Other methods of killing Russian soldiers are far cruder and more brutal. Aside from the firearms or drones, Ukraine's women are being trained to kill with office supplies if necessary. A woman named Olena Biletska, who founded a resistance group called the Ukraine's Women's Guard in 2014, bragged that some of her fighters could kill the enemy with a pen or pencil. Other women with partisan groups have been known to poison Russian soldiers by giving them toxin-laced food or liquor. One incident in Crimea saw two attractive women in a partisan group called the Crimea Combat Seagulls poison 24 Russian soldiers and 11 officers after giving them bad vodka and snacks. Enamored by the two cute girls offering them free food and drinks, the Russians took the gifts without question, much to their detriment. The group claims that all of the targets were killed. If women in the Ukraine have been targeted for sex by Russian soldiers, it's in incidents like these where we see the equation being reversed. Ukrainian women have also used their sex as a weapon against the invaders. By the end of 2022, 350 Ukrainian women received rewards for their bravery in combat. Two of them received Ukraine's highest honor, the Hero of Ukraine, posthumously. As of August 2023, about 100 women were killed in action during the war, according to figures obtained by the BBC. The true number is likely significantly higher. But because Ukraine does not break its casualty figures down by gender, it's impossible to say for certain. With the war now two years old, Ukraine has faced recruitment difficulties. Attitudes toward conscription are souring, and the new draft law being debated in Kyiv has met public controversy that other wartime measures have not yet seen. Unsurprisingly, as the grim reality of prolonged warfare sets in, motivations such as patriotism have begun to ebb, and Ukraine's ranks are thinning through attrition or discharges, while draft dodging is becoming an increasing fact of life among the country's men. With Russia having the benefit of a population about three times as large as Ukraine and Vladimir Putin's determination not to lose the war, the Ukrainian military must find a way to increase its available supply of soldiers, which is why we should not be too surprised if the country calls on its women to do even more tasks not typically assigned to them, as there is still no end in sight to the struggle. Despite the threat of capture, sexual violence, and frequent harassment from their own comrades, the women of Ukraine have played their part in defending their country from invasion, often with distinction. And as the war goes on and manpower becomes scarcer, their country will likely need to rely on them far more than usual. In the West, wartime conditions have historically been a catalyst for a change in the way that women are treated. This war will likely prove to be a catalyst for advances among women in Ukrainian society. One of the snipers in Ukraine, codenamed Sultan, who was one of the three women that passed the FISO course, said to The Economist, She, my daughter, told me that if my death happens, she will be sad, but always have a place in her heart for me. I'm doing everything to make sure her generation doesn't have to deal with Putin and his crazy world. What do you think about the experiences women have faced in the war in Ukraine? What roles might they be called on to serve next? What advances do you think they might make after the war, if they're able to repel what one of their ranks calls the Orcs? Don't forget to let us know your opinions in the comments. Also, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more military analysis from military experts.